Hi, welcome to my playhouse. And today I have a new server that we should have a look at. It's not a new server, it's an old server. And this time it's an HP server, my favorite model of HP servers. And it's just because it's very similar to the Lenovo slash IBM 3650 that I really like so much. But the DL380 is HP's model of 2U rack professional server and I have one of those on the table behind me here. So let's go to the table and see that. Here it is and it's almost new. Even the plastic here on the handle is, has not been taken off. So let's just take the plastic off. And this server, well, even though the plastic is still on there, it's not a new server. Uh, apparently this server is from 2005. There's plastic on this as well. Take that off. And this is a generation 4 of the HP DL380. Actually, that's right up here. HP Polyant DL380. And the 380 generation 4 came in two models. This is the Scotty version. They also had a SAS drive version. And uh, this model has six Scotty drives. And the other one, the, the SAS model, that had eight two and a half inches SAS drives instead. I do prefer the three and a half inches discs over the two and a half inches. That's just the way I like it. Uh, this model, mm, it has a USB stick on the front here. Then it has the room for the, the six discs and they start over here. One, two, oh, sorry. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, which is a bit odd. Someone told me that that was because everything was made in China and they read from the other side. I'm not sure that adds up, but well, let's go with that for now. This one has a floppy drive right there. Not very widely used anymore, but it's there. It has a CD-ROM drive or DVD drive right there. Actually also a rewritable. It has probably never run. Then over here we have we have the power button right there. We have the release things for the rack mount. We have light indicators. This is a unique ID button that lights up different colors actually I think blue and well you can press it and it will light a diode on the other side of the server. Then we have the LAN connections one and two. They will indicate uh, the traffic on the LAN. And then we have some health diodes here if the server is healthy. I haven't looked into what these different symbols mean. But well, that's about the front of it. We have something on the top. This server actually comes with a bit of advertisement. After you paid thousands of dollars for a server, they just want to let you know how good a choice you made. Get the best return on your investment. Well, sure. Does this mean that the used retail price is good? Probably not. Let's go around the back. Here we are on the back of the server. And the first thing we see here is, oh, this is some rack mounting stuff. I'll just put that on top there for now. Uh, we have the serial number and the product number. And then we have three bays here. And this server comes with PCIX slots. It has one PCIX slot that is running at 133 megahertz and these two number two and number three are at 100 megahertz the model is also available with pci express then you get two the lower one will not be available in that in that configuration but you'll get a x4 and an x4 up here really the most used in servers are probably the x8 but well back then it came in an x4 then we have an external SCSI port, SCSI 1 here. That's really brilliant because the SCSI port, that could do 16 disks in one cable like this. So you could drive this cable down to a drive bay beneath or on top of the server and you would have 16 disks available for the server. Let's go check one of those out. I have two of those here in my data center and these hold 14 drives each. I've filled this one up with 72 gigabytes and this one I had, I think I had it filled up 
with 146.8 gigabytes and they were really made for the let's just put the camera for this one that's the DL380 model 1 or generation 1 but they were available later for the for the other generations they just changed out the paint more or less so yeah that's what they look like well back to the back of the server <laughs> back to back so this little port is also available on the back of those discs uh, well they're called DAS direct attached storage but when we move on we get to the serial port it just have one serial port right there we have a VGA connection right beneath that we have the ILO adapter right here and I do think that this one is mounted on the motherboard of the server where it was earlier an attachment a little system board that you put in we have two usb connections down here i don't think they're very fast they must be a generation one or 1.1 then we have two network connections i am not sure if this is gigabit or if this is 100 megabits i did not check that hold on i'll check that well good old uncle google tells me that this is in fact usb 2 is in fact USB 2 port. So they are fair bit faster than 1.1. And these two network cards or ports, they are one gigabit. They're 10, 100 megabits and 1000 megabits or one gigabit. Then we have the, we have the old keyboard and mouse connection, the PS2 connections. They were widely used for servers in a long time even after they were not used on regular computers because a lot of the management like this monitor and screen that i have in my data center they use the ps2 connections and a lot of high-end server equipment was using kvm switches which was also using the ps2 connections then we have the uid button that's the thing that lights up i think it's blue on the front and on the back so if i want to press this and I want to check out what server this is. This is uh, used in racks to find this server on the other side of the rack and it's it's okay to have that. We have two power supplies. They're very nice little power supplies. 575 watts each. Hewlett Packard DSP 600 PBB. Never mind that. But it has redundant power, which means that one of these power supplies can break and you'll still be able to run on the other one. And we have another rack rail on the other side. We have some light diode down here on the power supplies that indicates if the power supply is powered. So I think that was about it. I think I'll mount this so that it doesn't get lost. And I'll see. Probably something like that. Okay, cool. The HP DL380 Generation 4 is a very secure server with anyone who does not have a flathead screwdriver because you can lock it. Flathead screwdriver or a star screwdriver, you can lock the server. I haven't. And this is kind of a funny system because you move this up and the front moves back. It's, it's kind of weird. You, you press this way and it pulls that way. So. Oh, weird. This is how we like it. This is actually pretty good. There is a lot of good information on the back of this LED on how to do a lot of stuff. A big overview of the system board right here. What is everything with numbers and what it is out here. I'm gonna be very happy about this doing this video. I can just see what it is, read it out here. That's pretty nice and good. We have a big front picture here of the hard drives, what the light diodes on the drive. We didn't even see that, did we? Every hard drive has three LEDs right here, and they light up, telling me different uh, aspects of the drive. And that is explained right there. Then we have what everything is on the back of the server. See if it's a, uh, it does not tell me that was one gigabit. Okay, it, it does actually say here that if you exchange the PCI connections, you get uh, connections that are X8 
but they will only run at x4 speeds. Um, over here we have some uh, a diagram of all the light diodes that are on the system board and on some other small boards in the server. And if they light up, you can go ahead and see, oh, that's uh, that error, that error. Whatever is failing in the system, you can read that there. Then we have some server option installations and SCSI cabling configuration. So we have something on the fans here, hot plug and something about the LEDs. Every fan have, has a little LED that will light on on top of it, tell you how the fan is doing. There is some about the memory configuration here and the, these are called VRM, voltage regulator module, I think it stands for. And there is some memory configuration on the banks here. There is different setup if there is like one and two CPUs in the system. There is six blocks of memory, so this one starts at one and ends on seven, which is spit out. Then there is something how to install a new processor or take the old one out. I don't like the system they've done here, but well, I had a bit of trouble finding out what they meant about this, but well, when you've done it once, it's not a big deal. Then we have some SCSI configuration, the cabling configuration of the SCSI thing and how that all adds up. Let's go see the server itself. Here is the server and it looks really packed. That is a lot of stuff in this server. And when we get down to it, it doesn't seem like there is that much, but it looks like a lot down here. All this part is the drives. They, the six drives, they take up all this space. There is of course also the, the floppy drive right here and the DVD drive right there. And over here on this side, we actually have a bit of a battery stuck the way down there, just flapping around down there. Kind of weird to have it laying there, but well, it's in there. We have the two CPUs right here with their funny way of mounting those. It's like they are in some kind of an enclosement. These should be 64-bit CPUs and the server is available with a, with a number of CPUs and they're all 3 gigahertz from 3 gigahertz to 3.6 gigahertz. I know that this server is equipped with two processors and each of them is 3.4 gigahertz. So this one is actually the second largest server that HP made of this model. These are the voltage regulators for the CPUs. They step down the voltage from probably the five volts or the 12 volts. And I think I read something at 12 volt here. It says 12 volts input and it steps down the voltage to the CPUs. And I think the CPUs was kind of low voltage, 1.1 volt or something like that. It wasn't a lot, but that's these modules that does that. The server comes with one of these and when you get the second CPU, you get one more. Right beside the, the CPUs is the memory down here. And this is DDR2 RAM. It's 3200 PC2 3200. And it runs at 400 megahertz. It's not that fast memory. The server has the six blocks for memory. And it should be able to... The, the highest block it can do is this one is 512 megabyte block. I do know that the one just beside it here, that is a one gigabyte, one gigabyte block. So this server is equipped with five gigabytes of RAM. It can do two gigabyte blocks. So the maximum amount of memory that can go into the server should be 12 gigabytes of memory. Back when this was new, that was a huge amount of memory. And well, today you can still do a lot of good stuff with 12 gigabytes of memory. Further back here, we have a fan assembly and these are, HP uses this color for hot plug, hot pluggable. That's the color. That means that you can take this out while the server is running. Normally every IT duty, we like to turn off the server when we are gonna do anything like this. If we take the cover off the server, if we get in this far, I know that I like to turn off the server when I have to go in here. If I drop my screwdriver, it, this could be a goner. If there's power on and I drop a screwdriver down here, the server is probably a goner. But if the power is off, 
everything should be good. Except if the screwdriver actually hurts any of the components. Doesn't matter if it short circuits anything when I do that. Back to the fan assembly, you can take this up. This is very much like my favorite server, the, the Lenovo X3650 Model 1, where you can also take up the fan assembly. And I like this way of doing it, so it points to HP right there. Beneath it is a lot of connections. There is an internal SCSI connector right there that is not being used. There is some drives SCSI connector here being used. There's a SCSI. I don't know what they use all these SCSI connections for. There is quite a lot of them. The whole system board down here is just SCSI connectors and the connectors for the different fans are right here along the way. And over here we have, have some interesting looking thing here. And I... It's not on the drawing. That thing, I have no idea what that is. This comes with a couple of screws. So you can screw that up, screw that. This is how that looks. There's actually a lot of components on this thing. And you can put in your car chair. And these are the pretty high performance. This is pretty high end stuff. Do have another server, IBM 3950, uh, that also only has these connections. Um, you could get another tray for this and that was the ones that could be using the PCI Express connections. You can even get some uh, connections that are hot pluggable where you can actually take out one of these cards while it is running. Um, you would have to exchange this to get that one, but well, I wouldn't do it myself. Beneath here we have, this is actually, oh this is kind of a, a weird thing, this, this thing is for when this thing is in, you can open up the, this board here and you can plug in your cards. So they made like a tray here for, for doing that. Yeah, this is a memory card for the RAID controller. And the RAID controller on this thing is the i6 controller. There's a rather good RAID controller for the SCSI on this server. So they haven't spared much expense right there. And here is Ooh, there we have the CMOS battery, 2450. Haven't seen that one before. The RAID controller is one of these chips, I'm pretty sure of that. It has this 128 megabytes of cache, and that is connected to this battery that was down there. That's for if the server should lose power while it's writing to the disk, and it doesn't get to write everything to the disk, it will store it on battery power until the server is back on power. On the, on the drawing on the LED, there is a big cooling heatsink on this thing, and that's not in here anyway. I don't know if it has come off or is just messing around somewhere in here. I haven't seen it. Maybe they found out that it's not necessary and don't put it in. Here we have the graphics card, and this is an ATI XL Rage. Pretty regular server graphics card. It's nothing special. Behind the processor here, we have two extra fans and they are probably helping to get the airflow the right way through the fans here. They are hot pluggable as well. And beneath that is all the connections that go out, like monitor and keyboard and network connections. And nothing really interesting down there. Up here we have the back plane of the hard drives and connections to the CD-ROM drive. And over here is the connection to the floppy disk. And this is a this is really thick PCB that they've used for this backplane. So that's really good because uh, when you put in the drives, well, they can sometimes, well, you use a bit of power when you do that. And the connections for the drives are down here. That those black leads are the, the SCSI connectors that go through and connects to the drive on the other side. And this looks fairly good and it's powered over here with this connection that goes down here into this plastic thing down here there's like a power module and that goes into the back of the power supplies here the two power supplies are here 
goes around the back. Also, out of the power module here comes the power for the system board, goes down here. That looks like a regular ATX connector, but I'm not sure that it is that. It looks like it. Another weird power connector is coming out that way. Well, I don't know if this has, if this is correct or not, but I could guess that this could be power to power the ILO adapter for when the server is actually turned off. You don't have to power the whole system board, but you can power the ILO adapter and that will power on this thing when needed. That's, it's, a, it's a guess, I'm guessing here. That could be power for that, and this is power for the big system board. Let's just try and take one, one of these CPUs. So let's take out number two here. This, this is stuck in there really good. It's, ah. You take this up and it releases, and this thing slides over. And then the processor or the, the heatsink is free. But there is this little lever down here with a lock on it. That you have to push over here to release the processor and you can now take it up. These are the processors with the pins on them, so you have to be very careful. So you have to be very careful because any of these little pins, well, it's a bad idea to break them. The processor is really, it's connected to the heatsink. You're not supposed to take off the processor here. You can if you really want to, but well, it, it kind of comes with the heatsink. There is a fair amount of copper in this thing. It's actually quite heavy. This processor sh should be about 80 watts, so it's not a big deal. And the socket down here says that it's an MPGA and it's a 604 socket. The processor is a one core CPU and it actually supports hyperthreading. There is one core with hyperthreading. Let's put this carefully back down. I'm always rather nervous of dropping this because that would definitely be the end of it. It seems that HP has, has done a good job. It kind of goes into some, some leads that will lead the processor in the right direction so that it cannot go too wrong down there. And Maybe this isn't so bad. It's very hard to get this plastic thing the first way up, but then it becomes a lot easier. Maybe the system isn't as bad as I thought. Probably just needs a bit of training to do that. In here, between the voltage regulator and the memory and the CPU, is another chip. I uh, could guess on this being a chipset chip, but it has actually broken off. There is these holders in the system board to hold on the, the heatsink and one of them has broken off. Down here, that one has broken off. And it's a little connection like this. It's a little connection like this that goes through the system board and is soldered on and is to hold this spring thing that holds the heatsink in place. And this thing was messing around down on the system board yesterday when I was preparing for this video. I don't think this is gonna go anywhere. It seems to be okay stuck there. There's a couple of deep switches hidden away down here in, in there. You can just see them. One of them is for some kind of a system ID and the other one is for system options of some kind. I've never had to use a deep switch in a system like this. So I don't think they're used for much. Normally you can set everything in the BIOS. I just powered the server on and if I'm quiet for just a little bit, you can hear it's humming. It's actually more noisy turned off than a regular computer. So the fans and the power supplies are definitely running even though the server is not on. Let's turn it on.
HP pulling in. And it counts up the memory up here. I want to try and go into the bias of it. So I'm waiting for the bias signs, the two CPUs, the light on adapter, the rate controller is checking in, initializing drives, find some new drives. I got into the beast of this old server. It's 11 years old. I don't know, that is old, isn't it, for a server? That is old for a server, right? The CPUs are 64 bits, but they are missing the virtualization options as a piece of the CPU's instruction set. It has the hyper-threading and the 64 bits, but it's missing the hypervising thingy in there. So uh, you can do, you can use it for ESXi up to 3.5, but everything over that it's not compatible. I looked at the BIOS here and it's rather old, so right now I'm actually trying to download a CD to, to uh, do an update of the server. And I will try to see if my CD-ROM burner works. It probably does not. So I might be trying to boot it from a USB stick instead. It's also a lot quicker. But, well, that was a rather big tour of this HP DL380 Generation 4. Thank you very much for watching. Do subscribe to my channel so that you can see me again doing other stuff. And have a really nice day. Bye-bye.